Welcome everyone to the 15th annual MSU Israeli Film Festival. I'm Yael Aronoff. I'm the director of the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel uh, and um, the Sterling Chair in Israel Studies. I wanted to thank our film festival committee, which included Ariana Menzel and Ellen Rothfeld, Michale Dan, and Professor Galit Pellet, uh, who uh, viewed many films along with me. And I wanted to give a huge um, thank you to all our um, co-sponsors across the university. We every year have widespread support. So from the College of Arts and Letters, the College of Social Science, uh, James Madison College, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the Department of Linguistics and Germanic, Slavic, Asian and African Languages, Asian Studies Center, MSU Hillel, Muslim Studies Program, Department of History, Department of Anthropology, Film Studies, Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies, and the uh, Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives Office. So we're lucky at MSU to really have widespread uh, support every year for our festival. Um, our films and discussions and performance highlight the diversity of Jewish experiences, including the experience of Mizrahi Jews. Um, so in this next discussion in the Maborot in uh, resettlement camps. And I wanted to remind you, link to this topic at 3.30 Eastern Standard Time today, we have a performance by Yemenite Israeli singer, songwriter, Tayyuk Chaim of the sister band Awa. Um, she also has written songs about the Maborot and, and those experiences. So there's a nice connection, I think, um, for the programming at 3.30 to the film today. Um, and then after this discussion, we're having at 1.30 uh, discussion with um, Palestinian, um, writer, director, uh, Sami Zouabi, I will be discussing the film uh, Tel Aviv on Fire, which comically explores the complication of relationships between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians trying to negotiate their individual experiences and national narratives. And then we have programming next Sunday as well, uh, which we'll put in the chat. So Professor Mark Bernstein is the coordinator of the Hebrew program at MSU and is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and Muslim Studies at MSU, uh, is appointed in the Department of Linguistics and Germanic, Slavic, Asian, and African Languages. His primary research interests are Hebrew and Israeli culture and the intersection of Jewish and Islamic civilizations. And he teaches courses in Israeli society and Israeli film and the monotheistic traditions of Christianity, uh, um, Judaism, and Islam. He's the author of Stories of Joseph, Narrative Migrations Between Ju Judaism and Islam in 2006, uh, which focuses on Judeo-Arabic account of the biblical Joseph and explores the interdependence of Muslim and Jewish traditions around shared um, uh, sacred figures. And he, in the past, have been involved for many years in the Israeli Film Festival. So um, thank you, Mark, for introducing our speakers and. Um, asking those initial questions. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome everybody. Um, and uh, we had a chance to chat a little bit before uh, everybody joined us. Dino was telling us that uh, Israel has opened up and we just wish that everything goes smoothly and people stay healthy, that's all. Um, thank you all for joining us. This is a very special event. I'm very excited to be part of it. And when Yael asked me to uh, sort of handle the, the q and A. I readily agreed. Uh, the, su the subject is a very important one, um, that of the Ma'abarot, the transit camps, and the integration of Mizrahim, Arab Jews, Mizrahim. We'll talk about uh, perhaps the terminology, but um, into Israel society and the failures that uh, were uh, encountered. Um, does a wonderful job of highlighting. Uh, let me just say that the originally it, for the, uh, initial segments were entitled "Hope of Old Sort of Chaos," "Halom the Dream," "Ashevda the the Disappointment," and "Serch uh, Odaf the um, sorry the um, the leftovers the leftovers <laughs> the, 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 the remnant the, the, the yeah. Um, so, um, and I guess one of my first questions for you would be, we'll, we'll get into it, and um, is just in terms of the editing, was, was the version that we saw, was it just a compilation of the four segments put together, or was there some additional editing done? And then I have a follow-up question for that as well, if you wouldn't mind answering. No, it, it was the essence of uh, three parts, eventually, in the... And we didn't uh, made uh, a new editing. We we took the the most powerful 
parts from the cereal and put it in into 85 minutes. 85 or, yeah. Right, and let me just, I, I should have begun by introducing uh, our, our guests today who are the producer and the director of the, the series, the film. Uh, Dina Zvirikles uh, and Eric Bernstein. And uh, Dina, we know from the festival from earlier productions that she'd made. Um, and in fact, one was in our, I believe it was our 2007 Israel Film Festival, uh, Shalosh Imaot, the three mothers about uh, three uh, mothers in Cairo, uh, the Egyptian experience of Jewish families in, in Cairo. Uh, and Arik Menchen is the producer of the film, and we're very glad to, that you are both able to join us today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, let me just ask again, if uh, we're going to, if people can post questions, um, I'll be glad to field them, and, and Yael is going to help me as well, uh, just so I don't have to multitask uh, too much. Uh, there have already been some very good questions, um, but let me just add one more of mine in terms of the, um, the, the audience, the reception, that is, what, what was the reception like in Israel of the, the series? I, I've read some of the um, journalistic accounts and they were very positive in Haaretz and in Salon. I saw a very positive write-up. Um, but what, what other things can you share with us in terms of the reception of the, uh, the broadcast, the documentary in Israel? Yeah. All right, would you like to answer maybe or? Um, I can answer. Um... Oh no, the reception was very good. I mean, I think um, both in terms of the amount of ratings or in terms of people saw people saw the digital. I, and, and I think one of the nice things that uh, I'm not even sure we expected, but was kind of a something we were very glad that a lot of people saw it mid generations. I mean, and their parents or, 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 or kids and grandparents or two generations saw it together because this is a subject that goes back at least three generations ago. So there was a big response. Obviously, there were, like in any historical film, especially this kind of a film that is, you know, controversial. So there were people who didn't like this or didn't like that, et cetera, et cetera, which is, which is fine. And, you know, we always normal. say- Normal, normal, yeah. Yeah, if, we always say that if everybody gets angry at you, that means you did a good job. Exactly. <laughs> I want to add something yes, that yeah, uh, in the past, uh, people were ashamed of being in uh, Mabarot. And nowadays, everybody is very, very proud <laughs> on being in Ma'abarot. Even the, Ashk or the Ashkenaz and the Mizrahi, very proud. So it was, you know, <laughs> very popular subject. Yeah. It's funny, yeah, because when I was a kid, I was so ashamed to say that I grew up in Ma'abarot. That's a great segue, actually. I wanted to ask you if you could tell a little bit each of your own personal connections to the project and what, what motivated you and what inspired you and what you learned in, in making the film that you perhaps weren't aware of or, or knowledgeable about beforehand. Yeah, I must say that uh, we worked on Mabarot for four or five years and I remember that when uh, Arik uh, called me and asked me to join this journey, it was a journey, I was very confused because it's 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 very personal uh, project, pro project for me. And I uh, we came from Baghdad, me and my parents and my two brothers. And uh, we stay in Mabarot for three years. And it was uh, a very, very sad memory for me and for my family. And I didn't want to involve my bi biography with, you know, the film. But uh, at the end, I think that uh, it was kind of closure and the healing and kind of root, roots work for me 
that I didn't do in my childhood. So, and I, I'm, I'm very proud of the film. I'm very proud and to tell mm. the end, the story that uh, nobody told. And it's, it's surprising that nobody told this, uh, this story, even in uh, uh, Magasha Kesef or in uh, Tkuma, there was uh, very little about Mabarot. So Let me now- just explain, we... those, are, those were two very uh, uh, popular uh, documentaries about the history of the creation mm. of the state. And so, you're right, they, they skipped over the period of the Mabarot. Right, so, and me and Arik are very proud that we, we told the story that was not told yet. Thank you, Arik. Would you like to add anything? I, I, I mean, my personal, um, it was very different than Dina's. Um, I, my, my parents came to Israel as new immigrants in 1947, but from Chicago. So... <laughs> We, we a big difference. Big difference. Um, and, and for me, I mean, I've been dealing with uh, historical films, historical documentaries for, I would say, I don't know, at least 25 years uh, on very, very, you know, different subjects. And when actually I learned about the whole story, I mean, in depth from uh, Hila Baharad, which we should mention, uh, obviously, she was the historian who kind of followed both Dina and me all the way. Uh, she spent 15 years researching the Ma'abara. She did her, actually finished her PhD just half a year ago about the Ma'abara. And she was the first one who, we were in a lecture together or something. She said, you know, how about let's make a film or a series in the Ma'abara? And my first reaction was, you know, it's a, it's a, I, you know, as much as I know, it's a great story, but I'm sure there have been dozens of films already made. It's a waste of time. And then, like Dina said, when I started looking into it, I was amazed to find that there was nothing. I mean, really, the only there was the only film which was made about the Mabarot was the fiction. I think a 50-minute film, Dina, that Dina made. A about 20 years ago, did Yeah, right, yeah. So A little if, uh, drama, was, yeah. So the, for me, the more I started reading about it and the more we talked about it and the more I saw that there's hardly anything there. So I said, you know, this is really, it's, it's, it's very easy to see why this phenomenon has become kind of the DNA of Israeli society today, and it, it's 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 very seldom. And since, as I said, we I deal a lot with historical subjects, and it's 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 pretty seldom that you find a subject which a topic which took place seventy years ago, but is hot and is relevant today as it was seventy years ago, or maybe even more. That maybe doesn't. You, you're right. Maybe you could expand on that. Why do you see this topic as being so central or such a, a constituent of Israel's DNA in the present moment? In what well, ways? I think I, I'll say something. I'm sure Dina what you can add. I mean, <clears throat> again, we talked about. I, th I think we have to also remind ourselves of when we're talk talking about 1948. 1948 is when the state of Israel was declared. Um, Israel's in a, by the way, Israel's in a war, a very severe war, actually the most severe war that Israel went through till this day in terms of um, wounded and, 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 and deaths per capita. Uh, Israel, there's no money. Uh, basically, the country is bankrupt. Uh, there's hardly any food for many reasons. One of the reasons there's no food is that we were smart enough to kick out all the Arabs who actually produce food. So there was very little food. And uh, there was very little food to bring because Israel had nowhere to get food. So basically Israel, 
a kind of uh, survived under uh, with you know with the gratitude of American Jews giving money. That was basically the only source of income. And very quickly, immediately, hundreds and thousands of new immigrants start you know came to Israel. And as we see in the film, the first year it was mostly mixed. European Jews, mostly about 300, 350,000 Jews from the Holocaust, uh, Romanian, Polish, uh, uh, Hungarian, and then the Yemenite Jews, and then the Iraqi Jews. Uh, it was then, well, we'll get to it later, but then it was kind of so. So basically, what you see is, uh, and you know, regarding your specifically your question, the reason. It, it is so relevant today and is so, uh, uh, how should I say, sore today in many ways, is that uh, the same attitude um, that many of the, uh, mostly of the, the immigrants from the Muslim countries, uh, Arab countries, Muslim countries, received, kind of put down the foundation to you know, to, to, to Israeli society today, to Israeli politics today, and uh, to, you know, the whole situation of who's controlling and what, what parties. So it's really, it started then and then became the second generation. And we'll talk about it later, but what happened later on is that many of the Mabarot slums became poverty stricken communities. So basically, what the, the the injustice that was embedded in the Ma'abarot didn't go away, but it just passed on to the second generation and then the third generation. And here we are today. Yeah, and also in you know in every society in history, um, the first generation is silent, uh, but the second and the third generation uh, are looking for their roots and they, you know, kind of miss the culture, the language, the food. And the rage of the second and the third generation uh, is based that they want to fix the disrespect of their parents and their grandparents and to bring back their honor and heal their pains in a way. So therefore, you know, the talking of Ma'abarot nowadays is very, very passionate and uh, full of anger from from the third the the third generation that can they can feel the the pain of the parents how they were treated in during the during the Mabarot period. So but it's very very popular, very you know full of passion, full of uh, anger and full of uh, humor as well. The many, the, all of our people that we interview were without bitter, bitterness. So it was very, very nice to, to reveal that they are, you know, uh, uh, they remember the period of Ma'abarot, but without bitterness. It was, for me, it was really um, joyful to, to understand it. I think that's right. The, the lack of bitterness, I thought was, uh, and I'm, forgive me for not remembering the names, I should have written them down, but the couple, uh, who, the, the woman who, who was lost her hair when they right, visited, yeah. that was... It was an incredibly moving uh, segment of the film, I thought, and, and also just the, the warmth of the relationship between the husband and wife and the, the compassion he felt for his wife. And it was just, uh, it, it brought me to tears. Um, I want to bring, uh, I hope she doesn't mind, but Lutz Sofal, who is a scholar of Mizrahi culture, is on, on the call with us as well. And I think she asked a question. I wanted to ask maybe she, if she would like to ask directly. If, are you able to unmute yourself, Ruth? 
Are they not able to, Ariana, are they able to, are the, There you Hello, are. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ruth. Ruth, by Hi. the way, I should just mention, is a very old good friend of mine. So I'm very happy to Hi, see Mark. you. Hi, Mark. Thank you for bringing this as part of the Israeli Film Festival. Thank you, Dina and Arik, if I can call you by first names, for incredible project. I was born in the Mabra. I was born in Ramatayim, um, in, which is also close to the border of Kalkilia. So it added another layer. And I am, um, so this is very meaningful for me, very moving, touching, all the adjectives that you used. But I could not notice that um, there is a dichotomy in the way that you interviewed people. And I also, I, I understand the difficulty of weaving several narratives together, the historical narrative, the, the personal, narrative of insult and trauma and the scholarly narrative and how to put them all together and not miss and kind of create a coherent text. I, want, I, I, I noticed that there is clear distinction between women, most women talk are the women from the Mabara, they talk a lot about their experience. Most of the scholars that talk are also men. And so there is a, a clear dichotomy, none in the film at least, there is no one man scholar who is talking. And I also want to bring another distinction, not just the gender distinction, but there is a big difference between Israelis of Mizrahim who went to the United States or to France and London, studied and became part of academia as opposed to Israelis and uh, the, 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 the Israeli scholars. So this is another dichotomy that is very relevant and very much at the core of the ethnic politics. And I think it would be wonderful to include some of the non, uh, the scholars who don't work in Israel. Many of them are women uh, 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 in, in their narratives, just to make it more rich and to bring this problem. So one question is about how the difficulty of weaving this narrative. And also you talked a lot about the emotional aspect and what it means, especially for you. Um, as someone who is teaching this material, who, di who did research on it, I have to say that the, there is no place for bitterness in the public space. Bitterness is not something that you expect, that you externalize. It's something that you deal inside, uh, sometimes physically, sometimes it becomes a, 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 a disease. But I, I want to just highlight and not make it light in, li in, in light in, in, in relation to all the, 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 what you mentioned about passionate. Um, and just to mention Meshamrim et Asafa, that uh, it's a, a website of Iraqi Jews. I mean, I'm, I just happen to know about the Iraqi. I know that there are about other ethnicities that includes like hundreds of thousands of Israelis who participate in it and working on their language, sharing a culture and so nostalgic and emotional about their past. Thank you again. Thank you, Ruth. Eric, you want to? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure if this was yeah. a question or a series of questions or a statement. Thank you anyway, Ruth. Um, first of all, there were some women, including my sister, by the way, who's a sociologist. Uh, so she is, there was, uh, um, and, and, and actually we were very intentional all along to have as few scholars as possible. Mm. Um, to be honest, and I think Dina would agree with me 100%, if we could have done without, without any scholars, we would have preferred that. We did, it, we did it at the beginning without scholars. Yeah, we, we went for a the, long, the first, long time. The first cut, yeah. The first cut was any scholars, the first, Even more than the first cut, we had no scholars. And, and then we and found- we And like, we liked it very much. Until... And we get, um, let's put it this way, M mostly the scholars are there basically to help audiences to put things in context. 
that's the only reason why we thought, oh, I think it was a good decision, but again, it's, it's a very minute part of the film. So scholars, we definitely will never add. If we could, we would even take them out. I also just, because, can I just interject, Arik, that even the scholars that you brought in, some of the, like Sami Shalom Shitweet, are yeah. scholars and activists slash right. poets. Yeah. Sami Shalom Shitweet, yeah. absolutely. Sami Smocha is a very, uh, uh, very well known, actually the winner of the Israel Prize uh, uh, in sociology, um, and he's from uh, from uh, Baghdad as well. So yes, so uh, definitely there were there were not just us there, and um, but again uh, the the whole the the, the I, I think both Dina and myself and and our other partners, the scriptwriter and, and and Hila, share the notion that a film like this should be told through what we call witnesses, not through... Yes. Yeah, testimonies, not, yeah. Not through, yeah, it's not an expert film. Experts write books, that's fine. But um, I, it's always, I think, it's, you know, it's not, uh, 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 it's not holy, but I, I, I believe that. And in, another thing to remember, and that's important, is that Practically all the people who were interviewed were either kids or babies or at the most teenagers at the time. We're talking people, we're talking 1948 till 1952. Talking about 70 years ago, almost 70 years ago. I mean, I was born 1952, I'm not 70 yet, almost. So, uh, <laughs> That's loud. Admit so uh, and 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 the, so the memories of of people who in the Mabo that we interviewed were of like Dina said were of their parents were 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 kind of reflections of because you know the people that we would have loved to have you know people who came with families uh, fathers mothers grandparents. Uh, even the staff in the Ma'abarot, you know, doctors, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, obviously they're, you know, they would be over 100, 110 years old. So there's yeah. So uh, these are just points to, I don't know if this answers what was said, but uh, may, no, no, Dina, maybe you have something to um, We didn't define between men and women in, in the film. And uh, well, we have a narrator, a woman that narrated the, the film. Sorry. But uh, I think that you know that we 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 found testimonials. So you know, and uh, we're lucky that we found them because you know we could uh, in in five years. We, we couldn't find them anymore. So for, for us, we didn't, you know, define between women and men, and it was not the subject in our team yeah, the gender at all. Not, uh, was not an issue. Although, yeah. although I think in terms of the people from the Ma'abarot, if I can think the, the people who lived in the Ma'abarot, I would say it's about 50-50, probably more women than men, I would, I, I think. Not in terms of the of what you call the experts, in terms of the people in the mob board. Um, but our team were well, we were two women and two men. Yeah, the team was two women. And, and we we all came from you know different backgrounds, and we had a lot a lot a lot of arguments. Uh, but finally, with the <laughs> creators and the Israeli society. So in a way, it's, uh, you know, equal. Actually, if you would, I want to take some other, there's some excellent questions posed, but can I just ask you to follow up on that question was, what were some of the disagreements that you had in terms of production of the film? If you can share <laughs> Well, uh, me and Hila were... No. First of all, Dina, I must say the biggest disagreements were between the foreign of us and the broadcaster. That was yeah. the big. Yeah. We we were much more united between I, us. I think they, the the broadcaster wants 
to have uh, blood yep. on the screen, sure. blood yeah. on the screen, right? And uh, we didn't find this blood. <laughs> and we are happy that we didn't find this blood, you know, blood, the metaphoric word, yeah? That uh, people will say, oh, they killed us, they, uh, I won't forgive them, etc., etc. And I think the strength of the, the film is the kind of un, unbitter, unbitterness and the kind of, uh, you know, uh, healing and, uh, and accepting that this was the reality and at that time and uh, they move on. But they, it was it was a struggle between us and the broadcaster about about the tone of the the movie. And it's also the the main I think arguments. I can't remember them that much now, but it's a, it's 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 like Dina said. It's the matter of the tone. Where do you put more emphasis? Where do you put less emphasis? What, and 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 that's really um, again you you you, uh, you know basically you have these arguments eventually in in any historical film or series that you do. I don't think it's spe this specifically because it touches, as you said, it touches, and 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 what Ruth said before is right. It touches so many aspects, and it touches so many different kind of stories. And you know each one is. You, you can't say which one is more complicated. You have, you have, you know, hundreds and thousands of people from the Muslim countries. You have hundreds and thousands of people who just three, four years ago went through the Holocaust. I mean, you have a country who's in a, in a, in a desperate war. You have basically no money. So it's, it's, it's a lot of stories, a lot of narratives that actually blend together into one story, which is why it's such a great story. I mean, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not one story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, if, if I may say, I think that's our, where we succeeded in terms of uh, uh, relating to the audience that it is not a one story. It's not a one-sided story. It's not a one narrative story. It's many narratives. And, but on the other hand, together with this, there are lessons to be learned. And I think that's the important thing. And it, it comes mostly in the end of the film and it's mostly in the fourth episode where we, where we continue. I mean, things happen. I mean, we don't have to get into it, you know, with the, you know, Israeli society changed completely in this first four or five years, you know, 1952 the um, compensations from Germany, which definitely changed society in Israel. And uh, 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 so it's not that everything is fine. I mean, there are lessons to be learned. Nothing is fine, come on. <laughs> Nothing is fine. I, but yet it's important, I think, for the audience to understand that it's a multi-layered story, and which I can do that way, it's such a good story. Yeah. So let me just, uh, you, if I could, since you brought up the reparations, uh, our, um, the director of our Jewish Studies Center, actually, Yael Aronoff, had a question about reparations. Yael, are you on? Do you want to just ask it directly? Yeah, I think the, um, these were two different questions, although they're related. I think, Alec, you were referring perhaps to the reparations from Germany in yes. 1951, yeah. 1952. Too, um, right. and the implications they had because one thing that was really interesting in the film is that on one in the beginning there was a shared kind of uh, suffering among Ashkenazim and Mizrahim and perhaps that uh, compensation had indirect effects on then them being treated differently so um, so it'd be great if you could elaborate on that as Mark suggested and then my question um, related more to um, the two weeks ago, the Israeli government, as you know, expressed regret for, although not apology, and offered co some compensation um, to families whose children disappeared in the period that you cover. And I was curious, um, you know, whether, you know, my sense is that your film must have kind of brought 
greater attention uh, to this and capitalized the and you know kind of uh, brought more attention to the NGOs who were working on this. And even though the government, I think, was sued for this compensation uh, to these families, that perhaps your okay. film brought more pressure to bear on this government's response from two weeks ago. So they both deal with compensation, but one is from Germany in 1951-1952, and one is from the Israeli government you know, um, now. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, to, for you to elaborate on both of those. And if I could add in a question that uh, Beverly Wiener posed as well, in terms of Black Lives Matter, which again, the re issue of reparations has come up in our, in American society as well for- Yeah. Yeah, the well, big I, is a big. I, I I really don't think we should confuse the reparations from Germany and the reparations from our government to the MNI Jews. Different story, different. I know, I know. No, but I, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It's just that my question on the chat related no, to no, I know, I know. and then I'm, Mark would have brought up the 52. So that's I'm, what's I'm the only related. Not the, same, not the same kind of volume of money. Let's yeah. <laughs> Um, the, 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 this was the, a big argument at the beginning between uh, me and Hilai and Arik and Shai about the Yemeni, Yemenized kids. And Arik uh, thought that it's such a big subject that we can't put it on the, on the film. And uh, we didn't know what to do about it because we knew it happens only in the Ma'abarot, only on the transit camps. Uh, so we put it aside and then slowly but slowly, we discovered that almost all the, the, the people that we interview had a story about a kid that uh, was, you know, that died or disappeared or every, really it was amazing. So we, we put it on the first uh, chapter of the Syria and it was like 15 minutes. Yes. And you know, we couldn't do the whole chapter about it. Yeah. With, and um, at the end it was, you know, um, a scene in the, in the chapter, but a very, very powerful scene. And it was uh, really, we, we discovered it and we were amazed by, by this uh, discovery yeah. that every family had a story about it. Maybe so, uh, my, Arik, my, can, my, Arik, would you no, mind me? My concern was like Dina says, my concern was that if we touch it, we have to talk about it for two hours. I mean, I, yeah, but, but the, my concern was end, that we end, can't not Adina touch it. And Hila was right that we can't not talk about it. Yeah. So that was one of the really tricky, tricky mm -hmm. scenes of, and, and, and also, plus, it, we, we had a lot of uh, uh, conversations. I don't think I but really conversations. What tone do we take? I mean, but again, the whole film, and this is something that I, I believe in in all the films I made, and I think Dina as well, is that I, I don't, it's a personal thing, I don't believe in films that have an agenda to begin with. I mean, I, 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 I prefer films telling you a story, opening up facts that you, the audience doesn't know, asking questions, let the audience, build their own agenda, not I'll tell you what to think. I don't like, I'll tell you what to think that kind. And there are many films that, you know, they kind of, you mark the, you know, pinpoint the mark and then make the circles around it. So this was one of the, of the, um, of the definitely one of the major issues that like Dina says. Um, the reparations, or I don't even, it's not even the right word to use reparations, but today, but let's, we'll use it in, because there's no other word. Uh, I would say it's, you can argue, it's probably 20% honesty and 80% politics, maybe more, maybe 1090, maybe 3070, but it's definitely not something that we should write home about. The German reparations were a different story completely in 1941, uh, 42, 50, 51, 52. 
Israel again was bankrupt. I mean, the reason why Germany, that Israel initiated the reparations from Germany was basically there was no food. Right, was, Arik, when you were saying earlier how dependent Israel, the, the, the brand new state was dependent on American Jewry, that financial burden was shifted basically because of the reparations, the German reparations. Yeah, and the reparations, right. there were two kinds of reparations. And if you, if you know, there were reparations for the country, which meant uh, tractors, uh, housing, uh, army, etc., 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 and there were personal reparations. The minute the personal reparations came in, then all the hundreds, not all of them, but many of the, you know, 200, 300,000 Jews are coming from Europe. They didn't become rich, but they had enough money to buy an apartment, to open a small business. It's kind of what, basically that's what formed the Israeli middle class till this day in, in, in many ways. And these people could give their kids a better education, better schools. Many of them were much smaller families. So that really shifted the whole issue of Ashkenazi and Mizrahi very, very, very distinctly. And uh, as, as, as one of our interviewers say in the, in the film, in, in the Ma'abara, every morning, <laughs> another Ashkenaz family was disappeared. <laughs> it was like, you know, <laughs> a miracle for them. No, and, no, he also added that the, the I think who was, that they were very insulted. He said, you know, all these Romanians that were our friends, they lived with us for two years. They didn't even say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> they vanished. Yeah. <laughs> it was guilt, guilt, guilt was the major issue in the Mabarot, you know, as as it is in Jewish society for the last two thousand years. Guilt is definitely one of the main slogans that you can put. Everybody was guilt-driven by some reason or another. Was we that have a Jewish? Couple, Jewish. We We're have Jewish. some more questions. Yeah, and I'm going to ask if the questioners wouldn't mind asking themselves, or if, if not, I'm happy to pose the question for them. But I see, Elsie, you're on. Would you be able to unmute and maybe ask your question directly? There, you're on now, I think. Hi. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much, Dina. Um, like I mentioned before, I grew up hearing about the Mabarot from my mom, and it was uh, mixed. She said it was some of the most beautiful times in her life and some of the worst. Um, my mom was about, she was born in 1948, and they moved in 1951 from Iraq. So she was three years old, and she spent the better half of almost 12 years in the Mabara. So it was uh, a big part of her, of her life. And there are a couple of things that I like to touch. I mean, her, her story, and because of your movie, I was able to get some, some of the missing pieces because I started asking questions. So thank you so much. I didn't know the entire gravity of it. Um, I found out this morning that one of her sisters developed some of the sores on her head. And then my grandmother took her to the hospital and they wanted to keep her there overnight. And she refused because she heard about the stories of kids vanishing. And mm -hmm. I must say that, you know, I'm wondering if, if she was able to save her that way. You know, you never know. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, they were five kids in one bedroom for most of the years. And then they were able to get um, the second bedroom and I thought it was like a couple a year or so at the most I didn't realize that she had lived there for over 10 years with no running water um, bathrooms outside having to bring water in in buckets in order to cook um, and I think you know my mom said that she she started working when she was in eighth grade, she didn't continue on to high school because they had nothing. They, you know, she needed, she wanted clothes. I mean, she was a teenager, she wanted to get dressed up. So she started working and never pursued her education. And you, Dina, you talked about not as much resentment. I think that there's probably two different camps. I think those that were, were able to escape 
and get a further education, get out of that, you know, sinkhole, maybe had less resentment, but those where it affected the rest of their lives, um, I mean, they didn't have anything. By the time they got out of the Mahabharata, my grandfather passed away very young. My grandmother was left with five little kids, no money. Um, none of them, I was the first in my family to go to college. So it definitely had an, a, a lasting effect. And I think that those that ended up staying longer and not able to get out of that rut, I think they had a little bit more resentment. Um, you know, then the, those that were able to escape. And maybe I'm wrong. I don't, I'm hoping not. I'm hoping that by, um, but it's. Um, yeah, it's it's very complicated. I think that the Mabaro that were in the center of Israel were, you know. Yeah, she was in Ber Yaakov. In Ber Yaakov, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, um, the film, the, the um, Arik mentioned a, a drama that I made about Ma'abarot. It, mm -hmm. uh, it's called Kordania. And it was about my childhood in the Ma'abara. And we filmed it in Be'er Yaakov. Oh, wow. And it was still a Ma'abara. And uh, three year, three months later, they, you know, they... Um, leveled it. Yeah, or leveled it, it yeah. And, and, you know, it was, uh, it was like, I, 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 it was so emotional for me because I I'm saw sure. the tents and I saw, yeah. you know, You're the, making me cry now. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, yeah. I, I, I came back to my childhood and no yeah. uh, built, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> no built it as a, for a production, yes. And uh, so I think, you know, the people that stay very long time in Mabarot, in the Mabarot, you know, you, we, we have it in our film. They are, you know, they can't forget and they can't forgive, but they, you know, they move on and they live their life. And, um, um, you know, for me, the, the period that I spent and my, my parents spent in the Mabarot was uh, like uh, a stain, stain, yeah, a stain. Yeah. Yeah. And like- um, Ketan. Yeah, and, uh, but you know, you can, you, you clean the stain year by yeah. year and that's it, you know, and- I, I would like, I, I want to add, that I think, and I'm pretty sure Dina will agree with me, that the, I think the most depressing and learning or, or unlearning thing about the Ma'abarot is that once they moved the Ma'abarot to what they call Shikunim, to basically housing projects, nothing really changed. No. Yeah. And that's because when you have the second generation of children grow up in a housing project, which is, okay, there are walls instead of tents and there's running water more or less, but basically there's no education because many of these places like Dina said were in the outskirts. I mean, education uh, and, you know, for me, I must say I'm privileged in that sense that, you know, I went to a very good, school and very good high school. I could basically choose any university I wanted to go to, whether in Israel or elsewhere. But most people, second generation to the Mabot, definitely to, from the Muslim countries, they couldn't. They didn't have a good enough yeah. education to go to university. Right. That wasn't obvious. Yeah. For me, it was obvious. But it's not obvious. And that's yeah. one thing I think we try to show in the film. And you know, when if we go back to the discussion we started from, why is this relevant today? This is why it's relevant today. Because, because it affected the demography, because 
those kids were not able to further their education. So they right. they were exactly. on the outskirts. So we never, yeah. they never got that same level start. Because like exactly. you, you mentioned in the movie that in the beginning, they all felt they were equal. And then there was a disparity. And because they, in they, the beginning, they were equal. They were and equal, right. But the then they were, never, so. they were never able to catch up until more recently. You because know? basically people came, basically people came with nothing. And it doesn't matter if you came from Poland or Romania or Auschwitz, or you came from Baghdad or Yemen. You have nothing. And when you have and nothing, and I your think neighbor- there, there was there was also a stigma that all these people that came from Arab countries were illiterate and not as smart. They were that's definitely, that's definitely they were very a, a lot of the Iraqis were bankers and merchants and and uh, economists. Uh, and, and so they were, you know, people that, that had, you know, degrees and, and higher education and they were forced to do manual labor and never got out well, of that. Most of, the, most of the Iraqi Jews who were trained, who grew up in English, right, probably had a lot more education than most of the Europeans who came from Middle States in- Right, right, in yeah. On Poland. I mean, not everybody, obviously nothing is everything, but it's, that's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole different thing, but that's another narrative that we talk in our film is the whole narrative of the language. If you, if you come to Israel and if you can speak, obviously nobody spoke Hebrew, but if you can speak Yiddish or German or Polish and most of the uh, uh, the Pkidim, how do you say Pkidim? Most of the bureaucrats, most of the bu- bu- bureaucrats and bureaucracy is in speaks in English. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's very simple. But if you speak Arabic, and we we spoke the language of the enemy. First of Arabic. all, you spoke the language of the enemy, and you know nobody wants to hear the language of the enemy. And secondly, less much less people understood. So the whole issue of language. And it's, it's exactly, you know, to the point of what you're saying. And you That's looked a- more like them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Example. Uh, you were uh, bright, yeah, darker yeah, skin, uh, blonde hair. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Let me, but I- the, the, the major question is, did we learn something? Because with the, the Ethiopian uh, people that came to Israel, it, it was the same, the same, you know, the same mistakes we did. The, and uh, even with the Russian Aliyah, we made the same mistakes. The same stigmas. Yeah. We see like that and um, black and nigg- all this stuff that uh, we heard when we were in the Mabarot. We were right? So this is the major question of why Israel didn't learn anything from the mistake that were in 48? And it's a bigger question because, you know, it's a question, historical question. Do people learn from history, anything? I mean, in America, do you learn from history? I doubt it. I mean, it takes years and years and years for a, for a nation to realize their mistakes of their past. And it's not, it's not a simple process either. I mean, and, uh, you know, and, you know, United States is also a country of immigrants. I mean, but, you know, today Im- immigrants have a different kind of meaning when you talk about, it. and, and, and in, in Israel it's the same. So um, the whole idea of learning, learning the lessons of the past and, kind of implementing them today, um, as Dina said, it's not really happening. And but again, it's not an easy process to go through. No. This, is, this has been great. I, we only have a few more minutes left. So I just wanted to make sure that I, I got to at least some more of the questions. If you don't mind, I'm gonna pose the questions asked by several of you by my, rather than call on you. But um, uh, Bruce wanted to know was how you, Bruce Phillips wanted to know how you found people to interview. Also, the question came up in terms of the repression or the suppression of religious exerb- observance in the Mabarot of the traditional Mizrahim who came. And then uh, 
finally, uh, actually, um, Yaron, you didn't uh, specify, maybe you want to just add your question in terms of the production. If you're there, Yaron, uh, if you might, oh, there you are. If you want to add, unmute yourself and just ask that question as well. Arik, maybe you say something about the archive? Yeah, archives. Um, yeah, the archive is definitely part of the production. We had, I mean, one of the first things that we were afraid of is that we will have no archives or very little archives. Yeah. And um, Dina was in panic, that rightfully so. I mean, you don't have archives, then you can't tell the story. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we would have to bring 20 experts, which would be, have been faster. But we found out pretty quickly that this was uh, one of the most, I would say, uh, archived, filmed, recorded um, episode, not only in history, but also in the world. I mean, people came from all over the world um, to take pictures, to film, because again, let's remember, we're talking about 1948, it's three years after the war. I mean, the movement of of different people all over Europe was, was you know, everything changed. So it was a fascinating, uh, a fascinating phenomenon to come and to film. Plus the fact that in the, I think it's one of the statistics that we, were, we learned that in the history of humankind, there's never been a, a country who doubled its population in less than two years. I mean, Israel was founded with 650,000 Jews 640,000 Jews, within two, two years, there was about a million point three, a million point two. And this fascinated so many people all over. So there was tons and tons and tons of really wonderful archives and, and we were very grateful and lucky for that. Yeah, and they came to film the tents and the sand and the exotic uh, children. So it was very... Uh, photogenic in a way. Yes. <laughs> to film to say, Barot, yeah. <laughs> poverty and slums are very photogenic. Yeah, very photogenic. Yeah. So the we were, of, we the were question very... of religion. Does, do one of you want to take on the question of religion? And so... uh, the religion, I, ah, I really? must That's interesting. Yeah, That's a long I, story. I, I must say the 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 people in Mabarot were Orthodox, but not Haredim at all. You know, very light orthodox, very, very light, you know, keeping the Shabbat and eating kasher, but they were not Haredim at all. So they, no. uh, uh, the Ashkenaz and the, the Sephardi people, they came from, you know, this tradition and they, you know, uh, it, was, it was okay for them to, uh, in in term of uh, religion. I... It's interesting to point out also one thing that we touched a little bit in the first episode, then in the first year, um, let's say you have you have a Ma'abara of let's say 60, 70, 80,000 people, and you have one synagogue or two synagogues, and yeah. they would go to- They pray, pray together. They pray, they pray together. together in the OMCC, yeah. so one week it would be Moroccan, one week it would be Iraqi, one week it would yeah. be... And, and people got... A, and the, the reason why this changed, and that's a whole different other subject, yeah. when the country, when, when the government... The establishment, the establishment. When the establishment yeah. started taking over. That's yeah. when things, excuse my language... Yeah, because between then, the, the newcomers were you know, in a very, very good relation. Yeah. But then you would say, okay, this party, we want a synagogue like this, and we want to see come from the bottom. And that's another lesson to, mm -hmm. to learn. You know, if they were left to probably, you know, you, you never, you never know, you know, you can never answer what, if, but probably if they would have been left alone or more alone, with less manipulation from the establishment, things would have been different. Yeah. We'll remember it when we built again Israel. Yeah. Next, 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 next time. <laughs> next time, yeah, when we build a new country.
our, our time is really up. I just wanted to thank you both for being with us and, and, and sharing with us your experience. Thank you. Actually, we, had, we had slotted till 1230. So I think we, we, oh, we have more time. Yeah. So we do oh, have time because okay. there were some more questions on the Please, chat. Yes. Okay. Good. Cool. I'm glad I don't have to cut it off. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, Ron, are you still there by any chance? I see your. Let's see, let me see if there's anybody else. Uh, Yaron, do you want to ask your question, please? If you could unmute. Uh, good to see all of you. And uh, Dina, hello again. I, if you remember, I invited you to Austin. Uh, oh, no. Wow. Others. Good to yeah. see you again. Yeah. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. And uh, uh, I actually have various questions every time I add another question but I know that we have less than <laughs> half an hour and obviously there are many other questions so I'll be um, my questions will be very very specific actually maybe two or three and you decide if you want to answer them um, uh, the issue of language I mean I would just say uh, my background is very similar to the background of uh, Ruth, Dina and uh, Elsie uh, as far as uh, Iraqi uh, parents, uh, the difference is I was born in, uh, in Israel. But I do want to say in this context, uh, my dad and he's 95 years old has extremely sharp memory of everything, including Marbarot. And um, uh, actually I asked him to write some things. So I have two things to ask in this context. First of all, when I speak with my dad and we Zoom pretty much every day now, um, <laughs> It's still mix of Hebrew and Arabic, yeah? Or the Jewish Iraqi dialect, let's say. So my first question is, did you tell your interviewees, you know, to kind of direct them, you know, kind of, you know, speak Hebrew or whatever? I mean, was it any consideration of language or to turn language into an issue? I did watch, by the way, the whole uh, series when it was uh, first available. And the second thing is Shimon Balas uh, obviously wrote the, the Hamabara. And I just wonder if at any point you were considering a kind of incorporating something, him, the book, something in your work. Thank you very much. Well, we wanted to interview Shimon Balas and it was too late and his wife said that he is not he can't talk okay and it was a heartbreak for me because i adore his book but we put a piece from his book in in the film and the animation the all the animated the um, paragraph were from uh, the books about uh, Mabaot. So this is about Shimon Balas. You know, we, we were late for him. According to let the language, no, they they spoke, uh, you know, uh, Hebrew, you know, in. Uh, Arabic accent, um, even my mother, now she's 94 as, as well. Uh, she, when she speaks, she speaks uh, Hebrew with Arabic, you know, mixed, uh, very, very touchy, very cute. And, uh, but I must say that we were not, we, we didn't allow our parents to speak Arabic. I remember that uh, I told my mother, if you speak Arabic, I won't eat, I won't go to school or something like that. We, and they, you know, they forced to, to, to study Hebrew, you know, by hearing. Nobody uh, uh, touch, uh, teach them. And it was, you know, it's, you know, a broken Hebrew in a way. Uh, but I remember, and I, I regret now that I don't speak uh, Arabic uh, because, you know, nobody spoke with us Arabic, but it was really kind of, it was a shame to, to walk and, uh, and to, to see the people, um, you know, showing uh, of this, person that speaks Arabic, it was a shame. 
it's you know it's unhard it's really it's amazing to think about it now uh, but um, and we can't change it it was like but I'm sure that the, the people from the Romania um, children from Romania didn't uh, want their parents to speak Romanian and uh, the people from Bulgaria or Tur T Turkey or they uh, the children wanted to be sabres and to speak Hebrew and it you know it was for the Ashkenazi and for the Mizrahi for the Mizrahi it was heavier because the the, the Arabic was the language of the enemy, but uh, the children uh, was a shame of their parents. They were not Israeli, they were not Sabre, they were not, you know. So, you know, this was the period. We can't change it. We have to learn for next generation not to do these uh, mistakes. But by the way, the the Russian, right? The 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 the, the Russian children, and you know, they, they speak uh, Russian Russian very proudly, right, Arik? The, the Russian immigration is different, Dina, because um, lucky or not, the Russian immigration remained a community much more than the new immigrants, doesn't matter where they came from during the 50s and 60s. The Russian immigration, both in the 70s and both definitely that came in 1992, 93, remained a community and ate together and, 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 you know, and had dinners together and went to schools together. So, um, so it's, it's different because in, 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 in the Ma'abarot, Basically, you had, I don't know, 10, 12, 20 languages, at least. I want to ask if there are any, I know there are quite a few students online, and I, most of them are not, don't have their cameras on. But if any, but any of the students would like to ask a question, I'd encourage you to do so. Just post a question in the chat, and I can either call on you or just read it out for you if you uh, would rather that way. Um, there were a couple of questions about, one about Salah Shabati, the film, the original film, and then also about the documentary, it looked, refers to the uh, uh, Salah, uh, what was it called in Hebrew? Um, Salah Khan Right, thank you. Yeah. So perhaps you could reflect on, on, on those, I mean, again, uh, my classes, you know, I've watched Salah many times and my classes, unfortunately, you know, they have to see it, it's obviously problematic, but in some ways, it also raised some of the issues I think that you're dealing with even in, in your film. Well, it's a two different films. Salah Shabati, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely an expert on Salah Shabati. I'm less an expert in the other film because I made three films with Kishon, about Kishon. Um, and, you know, Salah Shabati is complex because in, in, in one way, it's ridiculous to have, you know, a kibbutznik like Chaim Topol play a, he was 22, 23, or 24, <laughs> when he played Salah, he, he's playing a 40 or 50 year old, we don't know exactly from where. No, it, we don't know where it came he, from. No, and, no we, we're not sure if he's come from Morocco, Morocco, it is a 50 year old. He was Mizrahi. With seven kids, as an, he's a Mizrahi. <laughs> That's on one side, so it's ridiculous. But on the other side, he's, as a filmmaker is probably the most provocative and subversive uh, film director that we've had in Israel from then till today. Efraim Kishon. Efraim Kishon. And I can, I can quote Efraim Kishon by saying, he said, you know, cause he was also in the Ma'abarot. He was lucky enough to be in the Ma'abarot for, I don't know, three months, four three months. months. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but um, and you know, and, and and again, it's part of the complexity. I don't I don't necessarily envy Kishon, you know, in 19, he lives he grows up in Hungary, you know, in 
41, he goes to the concentration camp. Then he goes into communism. You know, uh, not exactly, and uh, not exactly sound of music. You know, but um, but the film is interesting. Salah Kan Eretz Yisrael Ali Yisrael Salah. This is state of Israel, I guess you would call it. Um, first of all, you know, I I kind of criticized this film. I wasn't. I was a little harsh. But the interesting thing about it's and it's it's this, basically Salah the second film that you talked about starts where our series exactly where when our series ends. It's the second phase. Our our series mostly ends 52, 53, 54. That's where that film is. And it talks about exactly what we talked about before, about the a whole new wave of immigrants. Because the big immigration from the Maghreb, from Tunisia and, and Morocco came, began coming 52. in 55, 56. Yeah. They didn't come in the Maghreb. You had very few Moroccans and, uh, uh, and Tunisians. A lot of Moroccans, if you tell them today that you weren't in the Maghreb, they're very insulted. <laughs> because as Dina said before, being in the Maghreb is like, uh, uh, you know, yeah, like being, a status, a status you, have it. you get a badge, status, you know, badge yeah, of honor. A badge, yeah. And if you tell somebody, you know, you weren't even in it, it's not nice. But the the it's a, it's a, it's interesting, but it's a, it's a different kind of attitude of film. Not in terms. Yeah, of, not, it's it's very personal and and very personal. You know, it's very judgmental. It's very. Uh, it's, it's, and, a film, it's a film with an agenda. It starts with an agenda, a very forceful agenda. And, a very yeah. and at that point, you 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 could see that the, the establishment didn't learn anything from the Mabarot. Uh, even worse, Dina. They they <laughs> it it was it was worse. It was worse, right? Yeah, yeah. it was worse because the, really it was disaster. Sure. Then... If you take a bunch of people, I, I don't know how many of you know Israel, and you put, you know, hundred, uh, you know, thousands of people in a place like Dimona or yeah. Fakir or, or you know, some, I don't know what you would call it in the desert. Yeah. Obviously, the next generation will grow up with no education. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a given. Not even an argument. Yeah. And really, you have to be some somebody who is really very, very, very either talented or ambitious or an ambitious mother or an ambitious father who will to say, go out, yeah. I will push you till whatever happens. But it's not obvious. If yeah. you grow up in a place like that, mostly, most of the schools were what was called in Israel, mikzoi schools, how would you say that? Okay. Professional. Vocate, we say, you don't, you don't go, you don't go to be a professor, you go to be a welder or a builder or a driver. I mean, and, and, and that's, the, that's really, and that's the second generation we're talking about. And that goes back to what we talked about an hour ago in the beginning of the discussion where it's irrelevant to today because of that, I think, or yeah, because of course. Other, Dimona still is, uh, you know, it's, it's the where it's a desert. It's the end of the world. The next, yeah, how you yeah. educate the next generation? I, I wanted to return back to the, the question. I, I know you answered it somewhat, but I'm just wondering, for, for example, Dina, your mother and the, the 90 year olds, were, are they were they really not able to participate in the making of the film? I know but what about those people who actually experienced it perhaps the most painfully? Yes, the, the children are able to describe the pain of their parents, but what about the parents themselves who went through that dislocation directly? We had few of them, but, um, you know, like my mother, she can't, uh, you know, be on, in front of a camera. She can't, uh, she can't tell her story now. So the 90 years she could have in old, the past. No, if 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 I would uh, if I 
if I would uh, have it, uh, have her, you know, 10, 10 years ago, she, she, she could maybe, but I didn't want to involve her. I didn't want to make a personal uh, film, not at all. And most of the time I, you know, I kept myself out of the scene and I did it very, you know, professional because uh, I, you know, this is the way that I wanted to work as not as, not as a witness, but as a filmmaker. Lily asked the question, and I don't know if she's on, but uh, she said, do you think this film could have been made in the 70s or was there too much resistance and intimidation that it needed to, we needed to wait 70 years to make, this film needed to wait 70 years to be made? Well, Lily, I'm sorry, I asked you. Could make, you could make it yeah. in, the, in the 70s, but nothing to do with intimidation. It's ignorance. And right. ignorance is not stronger than intimidation many times. People didn't know about it. People didn't talk about it. So it's not intimidation. Yeah, I think it was the right time to do it, really. You know, timing is a big issue in in uh, documentary. It, in, it yeah. was the right timing. The traumas take time to deal with. I mean, when was the first film done about Vietnam? 20, 30 years later. It takes, traumas take time to... to in just... To digest, to digest, to digest, and then to to to, to give birth. Yeah. The you know my sister, who's a sociologist, a pretty well known sociologist, she wrote the first academic article ever written in Israel about the Ma'abarot, and that was 1978. That was the first academic article written about the Mabo, nobody talked about it. And it's not that people said, you can't talk about it. Ignorance, simple. Was it also because it paled, you know, in comparison to the, the suffering of those who went through the Shoah? And it's also, you know, it's, it, it's also, you know, we have bigger problems, you know, that's not yeah. talking. You know, yeah, and uh, it was, you know, a big chaos and after the war and a new war and, you know. So yeah. it, it, it took time. But again, I think Dina's right. It, it takes, it's the second and third generation who starts bubbling and bringing, you know, bringing it to the surface. Yeah. It, it doesn't happen in it with, you know, things don't happen just by chance. It's somebody else. Sure. No, I agree. And, and talking about that generation, one of the things that I, I would have liked to see in the film, and it's just because of my own biases as a literature person, was the poetry. You had Roni Somek, you had Sami Shalom Shitlit. To bring their poems would have been beautiful. Um, and I recommend them to anybody who's on, if you, if you can access them. They're available in translation, quite a few of them these days. Um, but um, what do you make of the, I, I, we've talked about sort of the processing the pain of the Ma'abarot, but also this renewed sort of pride and the, the, in terms of also the terminology, you know, being able to use Arab, the term Arab Jews instead of the problematic misnomer of Mizrahim, you know, Easterners, what does that really mean? Can you talk more about people like who are activists, the Sami Shalom Shitlit and, and the poets and the writers who, are, who have really come out, come to the fore in the last decade or so? Well, look, first of all, Mizrahi is a new word. Nobody told, nobody used the word Mizrahi or Ashkenazi in the 50s. You were, you were a daughter Mizrahi. Romanian, no, no. You were Iraq and you were Yemen. Right. Nobody was Mizrahi. Mizrahi, I don't know when Mizrahi started and why. It's, it's a ridiculous word. So was Ashkenazi. Yeah. But, uh. It, it was the people Two that came the, from the yeah. Arab countries and the, even, yeah. the Muslim countries. And yeah, Muslim right. Countries. Yeah. Yeah. God That's forbid. A but mostly people were, were, were labeled, if I can say that, by the country they came from, which is like it is, you know, you're Italian Jew, you're, you're an Irish Jew, like it is in New York. I mean, that's how people are labeled by the country, not by the some kind of 
racist origin or something. Um, yeah, I, I try to 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 put uh, you know poems and literature in 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 the film in the Syria and the, the you know the 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 ending song of Oni Somek. Kava yeah. Oni is a masterpiece, you know. It is, but I, I don't know how much people notice, know the words of the song. You know what I'm saying? I, I, you hear it in the background, but I, don't, I mean, I know the poem, but not every, you know, not that Yeah, many well, we had a problem because we, we had to, do, to put, you know, uh, subtitles and, you know, so. But uh, uh, I don't, I don't no, we did, going. we didn't have subtitles for the song, but we had the, you know, ah, the, no, 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 no. the kotarot. So, no, no. so, but yeah, um, yeah, for the Israeli, for the people that speaks Hebrew, there's literature and songs, and even Alterman, you know, the the not Mizrahi <laughs> poem <laughs> poet is in the film, so it's you know kind of represent every everything. All right, let me just ask if there, uh, I'll, I'll throw the floor open for people if, if anybody would like to unmute and just ask a question. If I haven't covered, I've tried oh. to uh, cover as many as I can. Maybe I'll, I'll bring us back to today again, if you can elaborate on the continuing social and political ramifications of the period you cover. Because I remember that, I forget who it was in the documentary who um, said, oh, in the future, um, people from uh, these Arab countries, I don't know how collectively Iraqi, Yemeni, Yemeni and so forth will be the majority in Israel and things will be flipped in a way, right? So I, I was gonna kind of ask to what extent do you think that uh, that prediction has partially come true in terms of it's, empowerment it's, of these it's populations and to, and to what extent they're continuing inequalities, right? Do you have these- Okay, in, in, in Israel it's definitely true. <laughs> no, again, if, if, we, if we want to go- It's happening. <laughs> if we want to go back and talk about context, um, you know, this is not the Ma'abarot and the Jews from the Muslim countries. This was not the plan of Ben-Gurion. This is not what he wished for. Um, he was stuck, you know, after Hitler basically left him no choice. I mean, the idea was that to bring a million, a million and a half Jews, European Jews, good, nice, clean, white European Jews to Israel and form a country. In 1945, it was obvious that this plan is not going to happen because they weren't you know, in 1939, we have 16, 000, 16 million Jews, 10 million in Europe, about 5 million in America, less than a million in all the Arab countries. That's what was left. That's the reserve that was left. So we have to realize also that the, 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 the resentment of many of the kind of establishment of Iraqan Jews, of Moroccan Jews, of Algerian Jews, it was it was real resentment. I mean, it you know we can talk about white, black, uh, you know, talk about colonialism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which all comes into that thing. Into or racism, or racism. Hello. Other what? Or racism, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But again, I mean, I mean, and we have we have quite a few. I think even in the film, we have quite a few letters. Uh, and, and writers, journalists who write about what, I mean, this is not the Jews that we were planning right. for. Right, yeah. Now, you know, we have... Okay, yeah, we have, yeah. I mean, this is not the idea that we, this is not the Israel, unquote, that we dreamt about. Because the Israel that we dreamt about, uh, you know, went out. White else. country, yeah, it was plan to be a white country let's yeah, say the, yeah. like the zionist like basically like the zionist movement because the zionist movement which you know you're talking about again europe in the in the 20th century was basically you know 10 million jews most of the jews were either in europe or on the americas argentina and the united states that's where the jews were so obviously the zionist movement you know is as a very white European, East European, West European is a very European movement. 
uh, it, it changed in 1939, as we all know. But that, not, that was not the plan. So today, uh, you know, in Israel, really, you have the shift, and the shift is started then. Yeah, because uh, the Mizrahi family has more kids, and, uh, you know, the music now in Israel is uh, very... Very, yeah. yeah. And, and the food, and, and, and like the, the man said in his uh, prof, prophet, prophet, prophecy, prophecy in the film, one day we'll have a, yeah, a prime minister, and we have, uh, and they will die to, to marry us, right? That's what he said. So it's happening yeah. now, very mixed marriage and, uh, you know, it's, it's very mixed society now. now thank you. I, I want to thank everybody for their participation and the wonderful questions. Um, we are, again, hopeful that along with the, the pandemic, Israel will also deal with its other problems, the underlying societal problems as well as the physical and medical ones. Yeah. Um, I did want to, one last uh, item. Lut, are you still on? Let me just announce then, for anybody who's interested, uh, the theme, the Frankel Center at the University of Michigan, the theme uh, for their, um, the Jewish Studies Center for 2022-23 will be ethnicity and Mizrahim. So if there are any scholars online mm. who are interested, um, Ruth, do you want to add anything else? Any case, uh, it's it will be a wonderful opportunity. And um, oh, can you unmute, Root? Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, this is an incredible opportunity to um, apply and also to send your postdoc uh, who are working on Mizrahim uh, in any other field uh, to the to apply. And for me personally, it's really important because 40 years ago, I taught my first seminar in Berkeley on Mizrahi writing. It was very, very early and I was really looking for all this translated material because very little was, I was teaching uh, Americans. And uh, now this is 40 years after we can do it with scholars. So this is really important. And just to highlight that this film is so important to in, 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 in the teaching and education. And, and like, if we say that one of the biggest crises of our time is teaching and ignorance, this feels very important a, a, a whole in Israel, but also in American, for American Jews and for uh, the world. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Arik, especially us. Dina. Thank you. Adios. Good evening. Coming. Yeah, good, good evening. Come back good in an hour night. for discussion with Sami Zawabi. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>